So in most of the spray applications one of the inputs that we have to give to the problem is what is called as the initial spray droplet size distribution. In fact when we look at the, the, uh, the spray, spray distribution function it says we need to actually look at uh, a bin of certain uh, uh, droplet radius and a bin of certain droplet velocities and a bin of certain droplet locations and uh, so on. Uh, so typically for example you do something uh, called a uh, PDPA experiment in order to try to find out what is the droplet velocities and uh, as well as droplet sizes simultaneously. So it is possible for us to actually measure them together but uh, you do that in a particular experiment and then you want to use that as a inlet condition to let us say a flow field uh, in uh, where, where for example this burner is now fitted into a combustor or a. Um, reactor and so on. So obviously the positions are not going to exactly be the same you are going to only get dry statistics out of it rather than um, uh, exactly know what the positions of the droplets are in this uh, experiment. So the best thing that normally people do is uh, if you now want to fit a certain burner with a uh, let us say oil spray um, you at least have to know what will be the droplet size distribution at the inlet to this this combustor from the burner exit and uh, therefore we have to look we, we, we need to know what is called as the initial initial droplet size distribution this is usually obtained empirically. Of course uh, there are recent efforts to actually try to computationally predict this as well um, thereby taking into account uh, the, the shearing of liquid sheets or liquid, uh, um, liquid rods, liquid tubes uh, kind of thing uh, by, uh, by the aerodynamic as well as hydrodynamic effects and so on. Uh, but of course there, there is a lot more uh, that needs to be done computationally in order to be able to predict Doppler size distributions accurately. Uh, at the moment I think they are mostly used for um, design of atomizers from a qualitative viewpoint like for example if you now change some uh, parameters how, how does it affect uh, the droplet size distribution kind of thing but they are always benchmarked and calibrated against experimental data that is obtained. Uh, so uh, this is basically like uh, let us say a used with a symbol G of, G of RL. Uh, with this you should actually be able to obtain several spray properties. So the, the spray properties are based on the droplet size distribution or uh, integral 0 to RL DRL DRL this actually is the total number of droplets of radii less than RL. And uh, you can also look at the volume. So 4 over 3 pi um, integral 0 to RL, RL cubed G RL D RL that is the total volume of droplets of uh, radii less than RL right. Now many times we use this quantity called the sotamine diameter or SMD uh, which can be written as in the form of integral it can be written as integral 0 to let us say certain maximum uh, RL that you have in the distribution RL cubed GRL DRL divided by integral 0 to RL max RL squared GRL 
diurnal. So notice that you are going to get something like an average radius out of this but SMD is actually a diameter so you have a number 2 a factor 2 there to make that a diameter uh, essentially or, or okay there is one more way by which you can uh, define this which could be more familiar that is twice of uh, sigma um, over all i ni or li uh, cubed divided by sigma over all i ni or li squared now this is actually something that is that, that is uh, more familiarly used because typically what we do is we now have a bunch of droplets and then we now try to size them into bins of certain uh, elemental radi radius uh, bins and then uh, you now count the number of droplets that are there in each bin that is the ni and, and so on. So you essentially get what is called as a histogram and uh, if the bin size is very small that means you are now uh, counting a large number of droplets and then placing them over smaller uh, resolutions uh, or higher resolutions of radii then uh, the, this can actually become an integral right. So the integral definitions are typically when, uh, when the histogram bin sizes are small and you can now try to fit a curve out of the histograms rather than keep them as histograms themselves but this would actually hold if uh, have histograms and essentially the idea of both the solid mean diameter in, in both these definitions is uh, we are looking at basically a ratio of total volume to total surface area right. So uh, ratio of total volume to total surface area. So you know when you now have atomization of a, of a spray and if the atomization is very fine then the total surface area is actually very large okay. So if you now have a larger and larger atomization done of course the volume uh, corresponding to it is also preserved. So typically if you have the same radius for all droplets then it did not matter you will get the same mean radius regardless of how you actually averaged you did a arithmetic average let us say so for example this is the total number of uh, droplets and then if you now have a integral 0 to RL or RL max uh, RL G RL D RL divided by integral uh, 0 to RL max G RL D RL right that would actually be the arithmetic mean and this would be like the sort of mean diameter you could also have like a weight mean diameter and so on. So all these things will actually amount to the same if the radius of all the droplets are, are the same okay but when you do not have the radii of all the droplets progressively higher and higher weightages is going to shrink the size the, the, the average size basically here in, in this case you can clearly see that um, you, you have a large surface area then that is going to actually pull down the mean right. So typically what is done um, in, in, in order to get this the smooth curve that we talk about is from the histogram data you can now fit a what is called as a Rosen, Rosen Ramler distribution. So uh, this, this is very popular so the generalized uh, Rosen uh, Ramler distribution for uh, sprays is uh, this is a distribution function g, g of RL is equal to B of RL to the power T exponential negative A of RL over S. So here A, B, S and T are uh, constants that are used to fit the data to this distribution. So A, B, S, T or constants uh, constant fitting parameters right. Now 
there are spe special cases so t for example t equals s minus s minus 4 is uh, rosen ramler distribution that is the original rosen ramler t equals 2 corresponds to what is called as a uh, Nukiyama Tanavasa distribution and S equals 1 is what is called as a chi square distribution. and so on. So you now have these four constants what we should be looking for in trying to fit curves is four conserved parameters uh, so essentially the four characteristics that uh, we should be looking for is four, character, four characteristics uh, n the total number of droplets which is something that we saw but here we try to take all droplets so 0 to infinity g drl the total number of droplets total number of all droplets then you have a mean which is defined as 1 over n this is the arithmetic mean. 0 to infinity or L G D or L which is the average droplet radius we can simply see size sigma so when somebody says size usually they talk about diameter that is the colloquial parlance. Uh, but in this case we are actually referring to radius so keep that in mind sometimes these definitions might be different and then you are off by a factor of 2 many times so you, so you know what to suspect. So sigma equals, uh, equals 1 over n uh, 0 to infinity R L minus the mean or the whole squared. Uh, G D R L which is the standard deviation and finally you have uh, the skewness which is uh, S times sigma cubed equal to 1 over n integral 0 to infinity or l minus mean of or l the whole cubed g d or l which is the skewness. So if you are now able to actually get some data with which you know the mean uh, or the total number and the standard deviation and the skewness you can fit the distribution that satisfies these things right and then try to obtain the, the, the constants and then now you have a curve that is a standard uh, uh, template that, that follows the standard template good. So with this what we then do what we can do is uh, once you have a good description of the droplet size distribution we now look at the conservation equations for a, a, a spray flow. So conservation equation for spray flow including combustion of sprays so conservation equations here we want to now define rho f as the mass of the gaseous mixture per unit volume of the two phase mixture. So you now have a two phase mixture with droplets in there and in gas 
and the gas is in, uh, gas in turn is a mixture of gases all right so uh, this is basically the mass of uh, the gaseous mixture 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 per unit volume of uh, the two phase mixture the rho g is actually the gas density so it is to say that rho f is kind of like um, taking into account the two phase part of it but rho, rho g is without taking into account the two phase part of it right. Uh, so if you want to distinguish these two then rho f divided by rho g is nothing but 1 minus integral uh, should say actually double integral you want to go back to the spray distribution function taking into account different velocities for different uh, uh, droplets so then that would be 4 by 3 pi rl cubed divided uh, to times f d r l d u uh, then the overall continued equation for the gas for the gas is uh, partial derivative of uh, rho f with respect to time plus a divergence of uh, divergence with respect to x of uh, rho f v vector is equal to negative double integral rho l times 4 pi or l squared or l dot f d or l d u so here what is going on is uh, uh, you know this is this is basically the rate at which the liquid uh, evaporates or, or its surface regresses and then produces gas right. So since since this is a uh, this is d or l by dt where the or l decreases as time increases you need to have a negative quantity to make sure that you are adding mass to the to the gas. So this is basically the uh, this is coming from reduction in the liquid mass liquid mass uh, due to droplet evaporation. causing gas phase density variation right basically what we are saying is whatever mass that is that is lost by the liquid is added to the gas because mass has to be conserved right. So the momentum into momentum conservation is rho f partial uh, rho f times partial derivative of v vector with respect to time plus rho f v vector dot divergence with respect to x of uh, v is equal to minus uh, divergence with respect to x of uh, the stress tensor including the uh, normal stress namely the, the hydrodynamic pressure right uh, plus rho f uh, sigma over k for species y k uh, fk that is the body force um, so we will we will 
name these uh, uh, once we finish writing the full equation then you have uh, another term which is coming from the evaporation 4 by 3 pi r l cubed oh no this is this is the uh, drag on the droplet this is the drag experienced by the droplets uh, <coughs> from the gas and in turn the droplets exert an equal and opposite drag on the gas okay uh, then we will talk about that plus the, the thing that I was just mentioning which is uh, the momentum that is imported uh, due to um, droplet evaporation so that comes from rho L. Uh, 4 by 3 pi RL cubed RL dot U minus V F DRL DU right. So here uh, FK is the force per unit mass of the k species that is basically the acceleration experienced by the k species this typically is different for different species if you have things like ions that are subjected to an electric field or magnetic field and so on so of k species G is the drag force that is equal to 3 over 8 rho G over rho L modulus of the relative velocity times the relative velocity to give you the direction. divided by RL times CD now CD uh, is the drag coefficient drag coefficient uh, depending on depending on uh, Reynolds number and uh, mass transfer number so it will also depend because you now have an evaporating droplet so it depends on mass transfer number Reynolds number RE so Reynolds number is RE uh, equal to 2 RL that gives you the diameter times density times the relative velocity magnitude divided by the gas to gas viscosity so that is uh, that is taking care of the, uh, the this term on the right hand side and uh, finally this term is uh, basically the momentum transferred to the gas by the vaporizing mass because when the gas comes out of the surface of droplets it now imparts some momentum to the gas around so this momentum transferred by the uh, vaporizing mass to the gas Similarly we could also write the energy equation partial derivative with respect to time of rho f times hf plus v squared by 2 plus divergence with respect to x 
of uh, rho f v h f plus v squared over 2 this is the total energy equation that means it includes the kinetic energy also uh, equals minus divergence with respect to x of uh, q vector minus the stress tensor dotted with uh, uh, gradient of v so this is basically a, a tensor gradient of a vector is a tensor the uh, uh, stress tensor is a second order tensor therefore this is actually a double dot product okay giving rise to a scalar finally uh, as part of the energy equation plus the the partial derivative of pressure with respect to time that's for the that's coming from the pv work and uh, then you have the uh, the effect of uh, body force over k yk fk vector dot v plus capital vk this is the diffusion velocity of the k species uh, keep in mind uh, uh, this is what the momentum equation is all about so this is the total energy equation if you got the thermal equation thermal energy equation alone that would be by dotting that with v which is the mixture gaseous mixture average velocity uh, so that this might go away but this would still stay right so uh, the, the body force acts on the actual velocity of the species which includes the diffusion velocity as well as the average velocity of the mixture the gaseous mixture uh, minus then you have a couple of terms that are specific to uh, droplets so you now have a rho L 4, 4 over 3 pi R L cubed um, G uh, U this is the work done due to the drag force times F D R L D U minus integral rho L 4 pi R L square that is the surface area times R L dot um, H plus U modulus square times F D R L D U right. We need to go back and check here. I think this must be four. This must be four r four pi r l square because uh, we are looking at the uh, surface of, surface evaporation. Okay. And then finally, we have the. Species, species conservation which is rather straightforward uh, with respect to time partial derivative of uh, rho f y k plus um, divergence with respect to x of uh, rho f v plus capital V k uh, yk so this takes care of the diffusion mass flux right um, equal to the chemical production minus we also have production of the k species of the gas from droplet evaporation right so rho l 4 pi r square rl squared R L dot omega k f d R L d u where omega k is actually the radial mass flux of k species from droplet 
droplet surface. Okay, just could squeeze some space there for writing that. So what then happens is if you now write out these equations, this is sort of similar to the governing equations that we wrote for a homogeneous combustion. That means all all species being gaseous, but here this is for heterogeneous combustion where you are now throwing in a bunch of liquid droplets, typically fuel droplets. And in in each of these equations, you can see that there is a source term that is coming out, at least one or two source terms that are coming up because of the droplet. That means the droplet would now add mass to the gases. It could now impart momentum in a couple of different ways, energy in a couple of different ways, and also throw in a particular species into the gas, and therefore bring comes in as source terms in the in the equations. Now. What you have to imagine here is let us suppose that we try to solve this for a typical flow field uh, which is quite turbulent. Uh, there are some very nice research uh, that have been done which now begin to uh, look at what is the effect of the turbulence on these droplets and what is the effect of these droplets on the turbulence. Okay. So uh, typically what happens when you now have a locally high Reynolds number situation based on the mean based on the relative velocity between the gas and the droplet velocity you could now have a wake that is shedding behind the droplet okay. So you now have a overall turbulent field into which now the droplet is actually moving following the turbulent flow around but as it is moving it is also producing a wake behind it and this wake is obviously of length scale of the order of the droplet size rather than that of the, uh, the the characteristic dimensions of your combustor or your burner or something which the overall turbulent the prevailing turbulence is uh, is of a length scale of. Um, so what happens is you now have these multiple length scales of turbulence the larger length scale corresponding to the uh, combustor geometry and the small length scales of uh, the wake turbulence uh, from these droplets. So uh, a, a, a snapshot for example if you were to now do something like a PIV uh, of this and take like a, 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 a planar data of what the flow field is you will now have like a large scale motions captured uh, over, over uh, uh, the larger area with like pockets of intense small scale turbulence here and there because the droplets have just gone past these planes here and there so that is typically described as a a Swiss cheese because in, if you now take like Swiss cheese you now have these lots of these holes there are these holes now filled up with in this case um, the droplet turbulence this is pretty interesting. The other thing now if you now begin to think about uh, uh, these droplets burning rather than just evaporating and let us suppose that uh, we, we were talking about the, uh, the, the group combustion num uh, number which which now allows for individual droplets to have flames associated with them. We never really talked about what happens when you have droplets in motion, right? So the, the the kind of even the kind of pictures that we drew were as if like the droplets were stationary and do, and you have an envelope flame that is spherically symmetric about the droplet, assuming the droplet itself is spherical to begin with. Uh, that's all right, but uh, when you now have a droplet in motion, because of the motion, the flame now becomes asymmetric, right? So uh, a, a simpler experiment for that would be if you now have a droplet uh, and then you have a uh, let us say uh, a, a gas flow that is coming from the bottom uh, you now have a uh, flame that is now getting elongated along the flow direction right and you could still think about something like an envelope flame that is enveloping the droplet all around but getting elongated along the direction of the flow right. But then as you now increase the relative velocity between the droplet and the gas you now get into a situation where you no longer have an envelope flame you now have what is called as a wake flame that means so if you now have a, a droplet and then you have a flow relative to the droplet air flow relative to the droplet coming up you now have an envelope flame that is enveloping this and elongating 
uh, in the direction of the flow this is what we would call as the envelope flame and uh, <clears throat> if you now have a greater relative velocity between the two you actually begin to have a only a wake flame that means uh, the flow goes around uh, and, and actually causes like a lift off of the flame similar to how you have lifted flames you now have the flame getting really confined only to the downstream part which is what is called as a wake flame. So this is something that uh, uh, typically happens in, in these cases that is a droplet and uh, let us see that the flame there behind you right okay uh, I want to stop talking about droplet combustion but we are still in the subject of what is called as heterogeneous combustion that means we are talking about uh, some of the reactants um, or, or some of the species chemical species in general are in different phase when compared to the other others right. So, so far until we were talking about droplet combustion it was all homogeneous combustion that means we were typically talking about all the species being of the same phase and that is that is a gaseous phase. But the moment you start talking about droplet combustion we are beginning to step into heterogeneous combustion and yesterday we mentioned the situation of uh, let us say coal combustion where you have like a single single particle combustion rather than a, a, a cloud combustion uh, that is because of uh, uh, lesser volatiles. So, I will just quick, quickly talk about uh, uh, coal combustion and other, other solid combustion we also mentioned for example metal combustion um, where it is similar to droplet combustion because by the time the metals are actually burning they melt and so you have molten metal droplets that are burning and it is although it may seem like we are actually burning solids uh, in reality you, you might end up burning uh, liquids. So uh, if you now think about coal particles the problem mainly with the coal particles is uh, it is essentially twofold one uh, it is uh, okay before before we uh, in the context of talking about coal particles if you want to now go back to uh, liquid fuels. Uh, you can still talk about something called a single component liquid fuels versus multi component liquid fuels okay. So what is meant by single component versus multi component is if you now take a, 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 a fuel for example like a methanol okay uh, you are you're essentially talking about only one chemical composition or, or only one chemical substance there. But if you are now looking at something like diesel uh, it is actually made up of a large number of different hydrocarbons. And uh, each of those different hydrocarbons has different volatilities, and uh, you could now get into uh, uh, volatiles that are actually volat uh, volatilizing from somewhere near the core through the uh, less volatile substance, and and penetrating through that, and then coming out as gas. Right. Uh, so one of the dramatic examples for that is, for example, if you now have something called uh, uh, aluminized gelled um, kerosene. A kerosene itself is a is a is a uh, uh, multi component uh, fuel on top of it you now let us say you try to gel it with with aluminium and aluminium is less uh, volatile obviously when compared to uh, kerosene. So what happens in these kinds of situations where you have a mixture of materials that are of different volatility is the more volatile substance. Uh, so the, the less volatile substance will actually begin to accumulate on the surface as the surface is regressing right and as it now accumulates and the surface is regressing and shrinking the, the density of the less volatile substance actually increases and it actually begins to form more, more like a shell for example in the case of aluminium it could even get sintered together like a shell and it is a and when it is sintered it is like a porous structure through which you now have the um, the more volatile substance get get evaporated right at some stage this this shrinking continuously will, will, will now cause this uh, and then of course you have more and more aluminum reaching the surface right from within and therefore you now have this shell actually kind of harden you do not necessarily have it porous anymore and uh, you now have a gas because the, the, the more volatile substance has actually evaporated from within the shell and it now starts acting up with, with pressure 
right. So when it now tries to pressurize the shell, the shell breaks and then it now becomes smaller fragments. So similarly, you know, it, this is quite dramatic when compared to that if you now simply have multi-component uh, liquid fuel droplets that means you have everything is liquid nothing is really concentrating and forming a hot shell there but uh, if, you, if you now look still, still look at liquids the more volatile ones can actually volatile from the core and bubble through the, uh, the uh, less volatile ones and can cause what is called a secondary atomization that means it now shatters the less volatile ones into smaller droplets which, which, which uh, for, from, a, from a single parent uh, droplet. So the single parent droplet itself was actually obtained by atomization uh, but, but then you now have a secondary atomization because of this. So such things are possible. When you now look at coal particles you have a similar scenario where it is not really a, it, it, the, the, the uh, coal particle is not a single component, component substance right it is a solid particle all right and the typically you pulverize it into very small uh, uh, sizes but you are essentially going to have a bunch of uh, different things first thing you know you have a lot of moisture which is pretty bad because this is not going to burn right then you have what is called as the volatiles which is what is exactly going to burn right uh, and burn fast and uh, or, or evaporate fast or, or get released into the combustion zone quite quickly. Then you have the minerals which are bad because they are not going to actually aid the combustion but they are going to actually finally bring in uh, ash and uh, what is called a slag. So this ash uh, it could in the combustion zone uh, become like a molten region and then uh, as, as droplets or liquid um, molten liquid form they could go and get splashed against the combustor walls and so on. So this produces uh, ash and slag and then of course you also have char. So this goes through a solid phase combustion and gives rise to a residue um, and uh, so effectively you are now looking at only two parts of this that are uh, giving rise to energy the other ones could actually soak up energy all right and uh, this is pretty important because uh, in the case of Indian coals which is uh, and, and India really uh, relies a lot on coal and there is a lot of coal reserves here for quite some time that we can burn but it is all very high ash content okay. So the, 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 the ash content could be as high as somewhere like 30 to 40 percent it is almost like uh, we, we have uh, coal and ash rather than ash and coal okay so uh, uh, that is a kind of uh, situation we have as far as coal is concerned. Uh, similarly uh, you can also think about uh, this, this sort of a composition for uh, uh, biomass okay. So if you now think about biomass which essentially is uh, uh, let us say the, 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 the most common, commonly uh, encountered biomass is wood. But then you can also come up with lot also all, all kinds of things like for example even rice husk is considered like biomass okay. So you can burn any of these things a lot of agro wastes can be used in incineration or gasification there are lots of technologies that are getting developed uh, through these things. Um, so typically again you have to characterize uh, what is the moisture content, what is the volatiles content, what is the minerals content, what is the char content. So doing this kind of thing is what is called as approximate analysis trying to find out what are the different percentages of these different things and then in turn you also have to find out what is the elemental composition of the energy uh, containing constituents and that is what is called as the ultimate analysis right. So typically one of the major problems with uh, biomass and uh, uh, coal uh, more with biomass because you have varied kinds of biomass uh, in, in, in the first place but even for the same kind of biomass and for coal uh, the problem is different um, locations where you mine them or where you uh, uh, what do you call uh, 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 harvest them uh, you will have different compositions of these. So you have to do the approximate and ultimate analysis for these first to get an idea of what kind of energy content they, they have and what kind of ash problems you are going to face and so on uh, in these things. But then once you uh, are uh, in, in a position to actually do uh, like pulverized coal particles then uh, the analysis is not very different from what we have done so far 
and it all takes us back to having diffusion flames or premixed flames and so on. Um, of course these things typically will be turbulent flames and we will talk about a little bit about turbulent flames uh, but, to, but within a gaseous uh, framework okay uh, uh, in, in the next few days I uh, will stop here for the day.